In this video, we'll look at the most important tricks you need to make deep learning work. These are the main categories. We need to deal with vanishing gradients. We need to discuss mini-batch gradient descent. We need to discuss optimizers, which are small variations on the principle of gradient descent that help gradient descent work better on large models. And we need to look at regularizers. Here's a simple network to illustrate the problem of vanishing gradients. The question is, to train a network like this, how should we initialize its weights? If we set them very large, then the activations will hit the rightmost part of the sigmoid function. That means that the local gradient for each node will be very close to zero. As such, the network will never start learning. If we go the other way and make the weights large negative numbers, then we hit the leftmost part of the sigmoid and we have the same problem. So you might say that the best thing to do is to set our weights to zero so that the input to all of these sigmoids is always zero too. But if we do that, we end up with a derivative of 0 0.25. And if we backpropagate down the network, multiplying all these gradients together, the deeper our network gets, the closer the gradients at the start of our network get to zero. And these are the gradients for the weights that first see the data. So in many ways, these are the important weights when we start training. These are three examples of vanishing gradients, situations where at the start of our training, the gradients we see are zero or close to zero, which means that in our first gradient descent update step, the weights don't change so that the network never starts learning or only starts learning very slowly. The ReLU activation preserves the derivatives for the nodes whose activations it lets through. It kills it for the nodes that produce a negative value, of course, but so long as your network is properly initialized, about half of the values in your batch will always produce a positive input for the ReLU. And for those, the local derivative of the ReLU will be 1, so that at least the ReLU, so that at least the ReLU doesn't contribute to vanishing gradients. With the ReLU, however, there is the risk that during training, your network will move to a configuration where a neuron always produces a negative input for every instance in your data. If that happens, you end up with a dead neuron. Its gradient will always be 0, and no weights below that neuron will ever change anymore. But it's not just the activation that can cause vanishing gradients. The multiplication by the weight matrix can also cause the activations of your nodes to grow or shrink as you move up the network. If the activations grow as you move up, then the gradients shrink. And if the activations shrink as you move up the network, then the gradients decay as you move back down the network. In short, you need to find a balance where the activations and the gradients both broadly retain the same magnitude. This means that you need to start with normalized or standardized data, with mean close to zero and variance close to one in every direction. And then you need to find an initialization for your weights that maintains this property as you move up the network. So at every hidden layer, you want the mean to stay close to zero and the variance to stay close to one in every direction. There are a few ways to initialize weight matrices so that they have this property. One is to choose a random orthogonal matrix. Then another is to sample the elements of your weight matrix from a uniform distribution with these bounds. That's called Gloreau uniform initialization, and it's one of the more common methods used today. Next, let's look at mini-batch gradient descent. This is the form of gradient descent that is almost always used. It's like stochastic gradient descent, but instead of looking at one instance of our data at the time, we look at a small batch of instances of our data at a time. The batch size is a hyperparameter of your training process, and it can be quite an important hyperparameter. With small batches, you get closer to stochastic gradient descent, your learning process becomes more noisy, and you benefit less from parallelism, and you benefit less from parallelism in the forward computation of your network. If you increase the batch size, you get closer to regular gradient descent, you lose some of the noise, which may hurt or benefit your training. You benefit more from parallelism, but if you increase it too much, then you hit your memory limit and you can no longer compute the required tensor operations. In general, good values are those between 16 and 128 instances, although this largely depends on what domain you're working in. Optimizers are algorithms that slightly adapt the gradient descent update rule to improve the convergence of your learning process. There are a large number of them, but we'll only look briefly at these three. Momentum, Nestor of Momentum, and Adam. In general, it's good advice to use Adam 
but you can occasionally try Nesterov momentum to see if it works better than Adam. Let's start with momentum. At the top, we see the update rule for plane gradient descent. At the bottom, we see what that looks like with momentum. Instead of applying the gradient directly to w, we apply a vector v to w. This vector is summed to w, and we update the vector v at each step. And the way we do this is to make the new v a weighted mixture of the old v and the negative gradient, where this weighting is controlled by the hyperparameters mu and eta. If gradient descent is like a hiker in a snowstorm, then gradient descent with momentum is like a boulder rolling down a hill. The gradient doesn't affect its movement directly, it acts as a force does on a moving object. If the gradient is zero, the updates continue in the same direction as it previously did, and they're only slowed down by the friction constant mu. This has several benefits, and we don't have time to detail all of them, but one thing you can imagine is a lost landscape with a small local minimum. Plane gradient descent is at risk of getting stuck in that local minimum, whereas a boulder, because of its momentum, can easily roll out of the minimum and hopefully find a better minimum somewhere else. Nesterov momentum is a slight tweak. In regular momentum, the actual step taken is the sum of two vectors, the momentum step, a step in the direction we took last time, and a gradient step, a step in the direction of steepest descent at the current point. Since we know that we're taking the momentum step anyway, we might as well evaluate the gradient after the momentum step. Hopefully this will make the gradient slightly more accurate. The Atom Optimizer combines the idea of momentum with the idea that in large, complicated networks, each weight should have its own learning rate. Different weights perform very different functions, so ideally we want to look at the properties of the loss landscape for each weight and scale the global learning rate by these. The way we can do this is to look at the sizes of recent gradients we've seen for each separate weight. The bigger the recent gradients, the bigger we want the learning rate to be. However, if there's a lot of variance in the recent gradients, we want to reduce the learning rate because the landscape is unpredictable. Thus, if we scale the learning rate by the mean m over the recent gradients and divide that by the square root of the variance, plus some small epsilon to avoid division by zero, we will end up with a direction that uses recent information about the lost landscape to adapt the gradient to the local topology. The way we compute this mean and variance are as exponential moving average. So instead of taking a fixed history and looking at the mean over just that history, we look at the mean over all of our history in such a way that the most recent examples weigh more than those that we observed longer ago. But all of them play some part in the total sum. Where Nesterov momentum came with one extra hyperparameter in addition to the learning rate, Adam comes with two extra hyperparameters, beta 1 and beta 2. In practice, the defaults are fine, and you rarely have to change these. Finally, let's look at regularization methods. The bigger your model, the greater the capacity for overfitting. Regularizers are methods that attempt to pull the model back towards more simple models, without completely eliminating the possibility for finding the more complex solutions. The L2 regularizer considers models with small parameters to be simpler, and therefore preferable. It adds a penalty to the loss for models with larger weights. To implement the regularizer, we flatten all the parameters of the model into a single vector, compute its L2 norm, and add this to the loss multiplied by a hyperparameter lambda. That way models with bigger weights get a higher loss. If we think of our model space like this, then these two vectors represent models, and the length of these arrows for the two models represent the penalty that these models have to pay under this L2 regularizer. So the penalty term is much smaller for the orange model than for the brown model. So the only way we would choose the brown model over the orange model is if its loss was that much more lower that it would compensate for this extra penalty. Often for the L2 loss, we add the square of the length of this vector because that is easier to work with. This is equal to adding the dot product of the parameter vector with itself. Here's what that looks like for a simple two-parameter model. If we have two parameters w and b, then our parameter vector is just the vector of these two numbers together, and the L2 norm of that vector, the length of this arrow in model space, is the square root of the squares of all these parameters summed together. This idea can be generalized into something called an LP norm, 
where instead of taking the squares, we raise to the power of 2, and instead of taking the square root, we take the pth root. We can visualize what these different LP norms look like by drawing the set of points that have the same LP norm. In the case of the L2 norm, this gives us a circle. If we set p to 1, the norm is simply the sum of the absolute values of all the parameters. And the set of points whose absolute values sum to the same value forms a diamond. And the lower we go, the more these faces are pulled in towards the origin. The reason this is relevant is that if we define our regularizer based on the L1 norm instead of the L2 norm, we see that the model is allowed to move further away from the origin so long as it moves along the axes. This is, often, this is a way to learn models with sparse weight matrices where some of the parameter values are set equal to zero, which is true if the model hits one of these axes. Here's an analogy to help you understand. Imagine that you have a bowl and you roll a marble down it to find the lowest point. Applying L2 laws is like tipping the ball slightly to the right. You shift the lowest point in some direction, like towards the origin. L1 loss is a bit like using a square ball, which has grooves along the dimensions. Now, when you tip the ball, the marble is likely to end up in one of the grooves. We can plot what this looks like for the loss landscape of the linear regression from the second lecture. Here is what the unregularized loss landscape looked like. If we add an L2 regularizer, we pull the region of high, we pull the region of low loss towards the origin, meaning that there is some trade-off happening between how well we solve the regression problem and how close to the origin we are. If we add an L1 regularizer, the same thing happens, but we see that the regions along the axes are values of low loss, where the model is allowed to travel much further from the origin than it would if it wasn't hitting one of the axes. We can see this principle in action in the TensorFlow playground. Here we're looking at a simple linear classifier and we've loaded the circular data set. Now we've noted before that if we add the expanded features x1 squared and x2 squared, and we can use those to perfectly solve this classification problem. And if we look at the magnitudes of the weights, we see that for, the, for our expanded features, they are relatively big, And for the original features, they get smaller and smaller. But they never quite go to zero. So long as the classifier can draw this decision boundary, it doesn't matter whether this weight is close to zero or exactly zero. To tell our classifier that we want weights that are exactly zero, if at all possible, we can set an L1 regularizer. So now, the L1 norm of all the weights is added to the loss and multiplied by the value lambda equals 0 0.03. If we start training now, we see that the classifier solved the problem. And we've seen that the weights of the features that are not necessary reduced to zero, whereas the weights of the features that are used, sometimes regularization is a term you just tack on to your loss function in hopes of slightly changing the behavior of your learning algorithm, but quite often it appears naturally from some derivation. We saw this in the last lecture where we rewrote the SVM soft margin loss to an error term and a regularization term. So in this case, the regularizer is not something we added explicitly to combat overfitting, it's simply something that naturally followed from our derivation. The penalty hyperparameter in this case is added to the error term and not to the regularization term, but practically it doesn't make much of a difference which of the terms you control by your hyperparameter. Our final regularization is specific to neural networks, and it's a bit different. The idea is that during training, we simply remove hidden nodes and input nodes randomly, each with probability p. The idea is that to overfit, a neural network often needs to learn very specific things in which all of its nodes work together in some way in concert. If we randomly disable nodes for each forward pass, 
it disables the ability of the network to operate in this way. Once you finish training and you start using your model to predict, you turn dropout off. Since this increases the size of the activations, you should correct them by a factor of p. So if your node is present with probability p, then at test time, you should multiply its weights by a value of p. Frameworks like Keras know when you're using the model to train and when you're using it to predict, and when you use dropout, they will turn it on and off automatically. In frameworks like PyTorch, you need to tell the model whether it's in training mode or testing mode. So it's important to do that when you're using dropout. So to summarize, regularization is yet another way to provide a preference for simpler models. L2 defines simpler as those models with smaller parameters. L1 defines simpler as those models with smaller parameters and more parameters that are equal to zero. And dropout randomly disables hidden units. And simpler models are those models that are more robust to those kinds of perturbations. These are just three regularizers, and many other tricks are available if you notice that your network is overfitting. It took us a long time in the 1990s to work out the bag of tricks that was required to train deep neural networks. But once we had the basic framework for deep learning in place, and we started to get the hang of training them, the deep learning revolution started to get going. Let's look at some of the early successes, and these are mostly in the visual domain. Here, for instance, is an end-to-end -end system for producing natural language descriptions of photographs. The system is not provided with any knowledge of the way language works, only with pairs of images together with natural language captions. It simply learns to produce captions from examples using a single neural network that consumes images and produces text. And the whole network is trained end-to-end, -end, as we say. This example uses a convolutional neural network to transfer the style of one image onto another. So here we see a photograph, and the style of three different paintings is transferred onto that photograph, giving us a rough approximation of what this scene would look like in the style of this particular painting. Interestingly, this work was done with a general purpose network trained on a general classification task, a network which you can download yourself. And the authors took this network and didn't change any of the weights. They just built the style transfer architecture around the weights of the original network. This is an example of the output of pix to pix a network with images as inputs and images as outputs. To train this network, it was given examples of images in one domain and related images in another domain. For instance, color images and black and white images. Now note the direction of the transformation. The network learned to map a black and white image to a color image, as shown in the top right, or to map an outline of a handbag to a photorealistic image of that handbag. A follow-up work showed that this could even be done if we don't have paired images, we only have a large set of images in one domain and a large set of images in another domain. For instance, we can imagine there is a broad translation of what a particular horse would look like as a zebra, but we don't have a lot of examples of one horse and that horse as a zebra. We only have a large collection of pictures of horses and a large collection of pictures of zebras. The cycle GAN, published in 2017, showed that even in this case, a mapping could be learned. Not just on images, not just on images, but on moving images as well. So why does deep learning work so well? And why do we consider it such a departure from classical machine learning rather than just another model class? As an example, here is the kind of pipeline we would often attempt to build in the days before deep learning. We scan old newspapers, we perform optical character recognition to translate the text, we tokenize the characters into words, we attempt to find named entities like people and companies, and then try to learn the relations between these entities so that we can ask structured queries, like when did Obama become president? Most of these steps would be solved, at least in part, by some form of machine learning. And after a while, we were getting pretty good at each individual step. So good. For instance, that each one of these steps would make only one mistake in 100 instances. But chaining together modules that are 99% accurate does not give you a pipeline that is 99% accurate. Error accumulates. 
If the OCR has 99% accuracy, then the tokenization will work slightly less well than on the pristine data that it was trained on, because it's getting noisy input from the OCR. This makes the input from the named entity recognition module even noisier, and so on. What deep learning allows us to do is to make each module differentiable. We ensure that we can work out a local gradient so that when we put the whole pipeline together, we can also train it as a single model using backpropagation. And this will help us to reduce the accumulation of errors. This is called end-to-end -end learning. Other names for roughly the same idea are differentiable programming or programming 2.0. In traditional machine learning, the standard approach is to take our instances and to extract features. If our instances are things like images, natural language, or audio, this means that we may lose information in this step. The data always has to be this matrix of features, so we are constrained to an inflexible abstract task. In deep learning, because we translate our raw data to tensors of any shape and size, and then design a model to deal with the specific tensor shape we've created, we have much more flexibility and we can get much closer to the raw data. This means that instead of deciding what the model should pay attention to through feature design, we are allowing the model to learn which aspects of the raw data are relevant. And a final benefit of deep learning is its flexibility. Deep learning is to traditional machine learning as Lego is to Playmobil. Both can give you a school bus, but the Lego school bus can be taken apart and reconstructed into a spaceship. The Playmobil bus is single use and can do only one thing. They are different abstractions with different purposes. Deep learning requires a little more work and insight, but you get a lot of flexibility in return. The framework we've set up in this lecture, we will return to in future lectures to build generative models, models that can handle language, and even agents that can learn how to behave in a given environment. In the next lecture, we will return to probabilistic models and study the problem of density estimation.